Well, class, Professor Mandeville back. This is lecture number eight for History 102. And we're going to continue on with uh, where we left off in lecture seven. Uh, we talked about uh, Fisk and Gould attempting to corner the gold market. And uh, we're going to carry on with, with that same theme of corruption in politics during the Gilded Age. And one thing I'd like to remind you of, we're not covering chapter 16 in your textbook in the same order that uh, author Eric Foner does. We're jumping around and we're covering the politics first. And uh, after, you know, you may want to watch these lectures before you read the chapter or vice versa. So on that theme of corruption and sticking to the Grant administration, the next corrupt activity that plagued his administration was something that was known as the Credit Mobilier Scandal. Now, Credit Mobilier, Mobilier is spelled M-O-B-I-L-I-E-R. It looks like it should be pronounced Mobilier, but it's a French name. And Credit Mobilier was a railroad construction company and we're going to be talking about later on covering this chapter and the gilded age the uh construction of the first transcontinental railroad that we've mentioned in passing a couple times this is related to it and when we do talk about the massive expansion of railroads during the gilded age uh the federal government is going to subsidize a tremendous amount of that building meaning they'll just outright pay for certain railroads they want constructed in certain places. And obviously a prime example of that is the first transcontinental railroad. So uh, with that in mind, there are going to be billions of dollars flying around that is just ripe for corrupt activities, which is going to plague politics during the Gilded Age. And Credit Mobilier scandal is certainly a prime example of it. And what happens here is uh, the way that they subsidize railroads, especially, we'll be talking about in more detail this construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, but two different companies are going to be building the railroad. Uh, the Union Pacific Railroad Company will start in the east and build west. The Central Pacific Railroad Company will start all the way out on the West Coast and build east. And then, as we'll find out, they'll meet at Promontory Point, Utah, to, at the famous Wedding of the Rails ceremony. Now, uh, the government's going to pay them by the mile to construct this railroad. It's not going to cost railroad companies anything. And they have a set formula that they created where they would pay so much per mile for railroad constructed on flat terrain and so much per mile for railroad constructed through places like the Rocky Mountains. Obviously, they're going to pay more for mountain construction. And the railroad companies, through their construction companies, would then bill Congress and Congress would pay for it. So what's going to happen here, the one railroad uh, construction company, Credit Mobilier, who was building the uh, Union Pacific portion of this railroad gets into a corrupt scheme with members of Congress where they're going to submit bills to be reimbursed for construction of track on mountainous terrain when really they're building it on land that's flat as a pancake in Nebraska and Kansas. So since they're going to be paid substantially more, in some cases up to twice as much, it's all going to turn into pure profit. Now, the way they're going to get away with this ingenious scheme is they're going to bribe key members of Congress, including the former Speaker of the House, who at the time when this scandal was uncovered in 1872, uh, Vice President Schuyler Colfax. When this was all happening, he was Speaker of the House. He goes on to be Grant's running mate and vice presidential 
uh, elected vice president in 1868. Now, they don't just flat out give these congressmen like Colfax cash bribes. They're way more uh, devious than that. They give them stock in Credit Mobilier Company. So, as the profits uh, skyrocket for Credit Mobilier, the value of the stock that has been given to these key members of Congress increases dramatically also. So they almost become part of the company, so to speak, and they got a vested interest in seeing these profits rise, and in this case, through corrupt activities. All this is uncovered, and it's going to cause the downfall of Vice President Schuyler Colfax. Uh, he's going to resign in, at the end of the Grant's first term in disgrace. Now, uh, here we go again. A corrupt scandal racking the Grant administration. And this time it comes pretty damn close to the president. The vice president is involved. Now, Grant quickly says, I had absolutely nothing to do with it. I did not know what was going on at the time. And you can check all my financial records. I have never, ever owned any stock in Credit Mobile yet. So once again, he clears himself, but this is another black mark on his administration. It keeps drawing suspicion. Now, there's going to be two other occurrences within his administration that's going to, you know, make a lot of people believe Grant was just never caught. <clears throat> this next scandal I want to tell you about briefly becomes known as the Whiskey Ring. There were a group of whiskey distillers who did not pay any excise tax on their product because an executive order from Grant allowed them to be tax-free. Now, this scandal is going to involve another high-ranking member in the White House. That's Grant's private secretary, a man by the name of Orville, excuse me, Orville, I always have trouble pronouncing that. Orville Babcock. Thank God I don't have any Orvilles in the classroom these days. Now, uh, Orville Babcock was his private secretary. A private secretary to the president is the person that is the gatekeeper to the Oval Office. Keeps the presidential schedule, allows people in and out. If you want to see the president or uh, communicate with them, you've got to go through the private secretary. So a very close person to the president. Now, when this scandal is all uncovered, uh, Orville Babcock will turn government witness and he'll also clear Grant's name because the way that this occurred was... You know, on a weekly basis, or maybe more often than that, I'm not quite sure of the schedule back then, the private secretary is going to bring in a whole stack of paperwork for the president to sign. It could include letters to veterans who had died that Grant knew during the war. Uh, it could be uh, executive orders. It could be all sorts of different documents that the president has to sign. There'll be stacks of them. So he depends on his private secretary to sort of filter through it, present these documents to him and tell him, okay, sign here, sir. It's a letter to uh, your fallen friend, Major General, whomever. Here's a, another letter to a constituent. Here's an executive order that we talked about earlier that will do this. Here's this item, that item. Grant's not going to read every single one of those documents before he signs it. He's been briefed on it. He knows about them, and especially letters. He's not going to read every letter. He's going to direct, send a letter here, send a letter there. And the private secretary will draft them. <clears throat> so Babcock admits he snuck in this order to allow these whiskey distillers to be tax-free. And President Grant knew absolutely nothing about it. It was very uh, dishonest and devious on his part. And he admits his guilt. And Grant once again says, like he says, I knew nothing about it. 
And I have no interest in any of these whiskey companies. So once again, we're pretty damn close to the president. And the final scandal that will rack his administration involves his Secretary of War, William Belknap, an old friend of his from the Civil War. Now, remember, we call it the War Department back then, and the person in charge is the Secretary of War, unlike today it's the Secretary of Defense. Now, during this time, from about 1870 to 1876, we were in a war, an unofficial war, with Native American tribes out west. Sometimes they're even referred to as the Indian Wars. So, uh, during this time, Indian tribes are being defeated. They're forced to sign treaties, and then they'll give away large portions of their land in exchange for reservations. Also part of these treaty arrangements would be supplying these tribes while they transition to this reservation life with food and clothing for a five year period or so, farming equipment so they can become farmers and whatnot. And since this, we're at this state of unofficial war, all of this is being handled by the war department. <clears throat> so we'll talk about later on the trials and tribulations of native peoples out west, but this is just a hint of what's gonna go on. So Something that's very lucrative is to own a trading post on one of these reservations out west. Because typically they're in the middle of nowhere with, you know, being able to go shop at another city is just basically impossible. So the Indian trading post would be where these native people and people that live near the reservation would go and shop for their needs. It's also a distribution center for the clothing, food, and other supplies that are supposed to be supplied by the government to these native people as part of the treaty arrangement. Very lucrative thing. It's like having the only store somewhere with no competition for hundreds of miles. So obviously a lot of people want the permits to operate these Indian trading posts. To get one, you had to apply directly to the Secretary of War, William Belknap, because obviously people in the government realized this was a real ripe spot for corruption, to rip off these Indian people, charge outrageous prices and whatnot. So they had to go through a vetting process to make sure that they didn't get a bunch of crooks running these trading posts. <clears throat> well, it becomes known, uh, you know, it's rumored around Washington, you want one of these trading posts, you apply to Secretary of War William Belknap and include a bribe with your application and you'll be approved. So they run a sting operation, and sure enough, William Belknap is charging $24,000 a piece for these uh, permits for Indian trading posts. It goes directly in his pocket. Now remember, a bribe of $24,000, let me look this up real fast, uh, would be the equivalent of about $400,000 in today's money. <clears throat> so, this is a lot of money. He's caught, uh, and as a result of his uh, this being uncovered, he will resign before he goes to an impeachment trial. Articles of impeachment were drawn up by the House against him. Before the trial part of it started in the Senate, he'll reach sort of a plea bargain agreement with the government. He'll resign his position, pay some restitution, and avoid being impeached and embarrassed in front of the American public. Well, once again, high-ranking member of the Grant administration involved in a corrupt scheme. Grant once again says, I'm a, I 
Yes, I'm a really bad judge of character, just like with my brother-in-law, uh, Rath, you know, Corbin. And uh, I knew nothing about it, and I'm just shocked that Secretary of War William Belknap would be uh, would do any of this. So, Grant, you know, these corrupt the corruption comes awful close to him, and a lot of people kind of feel like. Grant was corrupt. He just never got caught with the sands in the cookie jar. I disagree with that. I think Grant was very honest. I believe, as I told you before, he ran the White House like the military, barked out orders and expected them followed. And he was a pretty poor judge of character. So now for our final uh, corrupt example we want to give, we're going to go away from the excuse me, Grant administration, and talk about corruption at the state and local level. And there's no better example of corruption at the state and local level than the famous, or I should say infamous, Boss Tweed of New York City, who was the political boss in New York City and ran the political machine known as Tammany Hall during the Gilded Age. Now, <clears throat> It was pretty apparent to everybody in New York City that Boss Tweed was on the take. It just wasn't apparent as to how much Boss Tweed was on the take. And now, you know, in the aftermath of what's going to happen to Tweed, it was uncovered that Tweed and his associates in Tammany Hall built the New York government out of at least $30 million, perhaps as much as $200 million. And part of the way that they did this, we're, later on in this chapter, we're going to be talking about the rise of the cities. New York City was growing way too fast, and infrastructure couldn't keep up with it. You'd have whole neighborhoods pop up, where you'd have large tenement buildings filled with people, but the infrastructure was behind. They'd have no running water or sewer. They'd have to <clears throat> use outhouses out behind the tenement buildings and fetch water at pumps in central locations. So when water and sewer and other utilities such as that arrived to a neighborhood, Boss Tweed would be there to cut the ribbon, take the credit, He's a hero, and sure, it might have cost extra to get it there, but they couldn't get, get it there fast enough as far as the people of New York City were concerned. So Tweed and all of his associates were on the take. But for a long time, people just looked the other way because these improvements were way more important to them. Now, what's going to end up bringing Boss Tweed down and end him up in prison will be the building of the New York County Courthouse. Now, back in this day and age, there was a county in New York, not the five boroughs as it's divided up into today. And uh, the court system in New York was tremendously overloaded because of this population growth. So everyone agreed, we need to build a brand new county courthouse. It's got to be much larger and so forth because the it's just not keeping up with the amount of trials and whatnot. So city council gets together and they decide that they're going to build this new courthouse. The original estimated cost for this courthouse was... $250,000. Now, everybody knows that government projects typically uh, have overruns on costs. But this one is going to be ridiculous. As soon as the project is approved, Boss Tweed takes over as in a position no, commonly known as the clerk of the works. He's going to be the one to make sure all the construction takes place, uh, uh, you know, get the contracts with general contractors of various uh, uh, 
specialties and so forth. So the first thing he does is he makes a decision uh, that they need to change the plans and construct this building out of marble. Now, the reason why, Boss Tweed owns two marble quarries. So guess where all the marble's gonna come from? And uh, before it's all said and done, uh, Tweed's quarries will, re will supply $2 million in marble for a building that was originally supposed to cost 250000 That's just the beginning. He's going to hand out contracts to all of his cronies. Uh, one of the uh, most egregious one was the contract for the plastering in this courthouse. It's going to be given to a good friend of his, Andrew Garvey, who quickly becomes known later on as the Prince of Plaster because uh, he will get the plastering job and he'll charge the county uh, in excess of a million dollars for the plastering job in a building that was supposed to originally cost $250,000. And when the building inspectors come in and inspect his job, the plaster's already fallen off the walls. They instruct him to get back in there and fix it, and he has the gall to submit another bill for a half a million dollars to repair his own faulty work. <clears throat> this and many other egregious uh, abuses will end up being uncovered in 1871 by investigative reporters from a new struggling newspaper in New York City, the New York Times. Now, uh, New York Times is a relatively new newspaper, and you got to remember, back in this day and age, newspapers are the name of the game. There's no radio, television, internet, uh, social media. You want news, you get it from a newspaper. And at their height during the Gilded Age, there were over 20 daily newspapers in New York City alone. It's a highly competitive market. Investigative reporters had heard that there were huge cost overruns, but they had no idea. Uh, they did an investigation and discovered that so far, the New York County Courthouse had cost taxpayers of New York $13 million, and it wasn't complete. Remember, the original cost was supposed to be $250,000. This is just egregious. So, they're preparing to put together a story that's going to be entitled The House That Tweed Built. And what newspapers will do with big stories like this, they'll run it in a series. So they put together this five-part series that's going to run in the paper uncovering all this corruption led by Boss Tweed. So Boss Tweed catches wind of this, uh, and he... Uh, you know, he's got eyes and ears everywhere, will send a couple of his representatives to the offices of the New York Times. Both of them will be carrying suitcases. They go in and talk to the editor and owner of the New York Times and tell them, uh, we know you have this story. We want you to turn over everything you have, forget you ever heard about it, and you'll ha we'll hand over the contents of these two suitcases. They open up the two suitcases, and in them is a grand total of $5 million. So they're willing to pay $5 million to get rid of the story. They know how damning it will be. The owner and the staff of the New York Times says we need to go uh, into the next room and discuss this. They come back and basically tell these two representatives of Tweed to get the hell out of their offices. We don't want your money. We're going to print this story. Now, <clears throat> that was a pretty daring move, especially when you consider $5 million back then uh, would be the equivalent of about $75 million today. So uh, they go ahead and print the story. 
It's the downfall of Tweed. Grand jury will indict him. He'll be put on trial. And luckily, New York City has a brilliant prosecutor at the time. Because when Boss Tweed was indicted and was going to stand trial, most people in New York City are saying nothing will happen to him. He controls everything. He'll get out of this. You watch and see. The prosecuting attorney in New York City is a gentleman by the name of Samuel Tweed, or excuse me, Samuel Tilden <laughs> Tweed. He's going to put together a magnificent case against Tweed, and he'll get a conviction. Tweed will be sentenced to prison for 12 years and start serving his time. But Tweed's not done. He's going to use his power to get his sentence reduced to one year. He served it and was released. But then he was immediately sued by the city for $6 million. Tweed will be jailed again because he doesn't have the $6 million and he'll go into a debtor's prison to pay his, uh, you know, pay back the city. While in this debtor's prison, he's a, still using his power and he's allowed to visit his family routinely uh, being released out of the debtor's prison, which is like a, you know, a medium security institution and go home and have dinner with his family. Now, on one of these occasions when he's on a home visitation, he'll escape. He'll jump on a ship and end up sailing to Spain. So now Tweed is a fugitive. But uh, in 1878, he will uh, be on a ship making money as a crew member that will end up coming into the port of New York, he'll be recognized and arrested and sent back to jail again. Obviously this time he's not gonna get any home visitation rights. Finally, uh, he uh, will end up dying in prison in 1878. So, uh, Thanks to the brilliant prosecution of Sam Tilden, who, as we'll find out, will end up riding that uh, wave of popularity from uh, imprisoning Boz Tweed to a bid for the White House uh, later on in 1876, uh, Boz Tweed is uh, apprehended and imprisoned. But boy, oh boy, him and his cronies got away with plenty of corruption before that all came to a screeching halt. So that's it for this lecture. I'll be back momentarily after I take a break. And we're going to start talking about uh, a few elections that occur, 72, 76, and so forth. See so how far we get.